Uh, thank you to the organizers to invite me to summarize in a few minutes what we've done over the last 10 years on the evolution of fungi. Kevin, earlier kicking off this session, said the uh, animal acutes, but the major players are plants. Fine, I can agree with you, but <laughs> please that just don't forget that there are fungi. I, I <laughs> and uh, we've seen very nice paintings of the uh, trying to reconstruct the, the early ecosystems. And there's only, there were two things missing, the dinosaurs, and my great grandkids would be very uh, upset about that, <laughs> and mushrooms. Are there anyone in this room who walked through a forest during fall and never spot a mushroom? No. So why the mushrooms are missing from your <laughs> paintings? So I'm, I'm here to convince you that fungi, and specifically uh, mushroom forming fungi, are very important for understanding the evolution of not only fungi, but also plants. So I'm going to summarize this work, and this is the outline of my talk. We are going to talk about forest ecosystems, Forest fungi, I will focus on ectomycorrhizae, the mutualistic symbiotic fungi. We will, uh, I will present you uh, recent data on the evolution of ectomaxal, the ectomaxal fungi. Uh, we will be discussing about saprotroph decomposers and symbionts. Are there really clear, clear cut boundaries between these guys? I will briefly touch the evolution of arbuscular microcell symbiosis, another important group of fungi. Then if I have time, I'm not sure, I can talk about the, the molecular symbiosis toolbox or toolboxes used by these fungi to interact with plants, how they control plant immunity. We will be talking about convergent evolution and um, I will summarize on the, the survival kit to make a good symbiont. I'm not sure I can do that in 25 minutes, but let's try. Forest, that's a successful colonization, a successful example of colonization of the terrestrial ecosystems and environment thanks to the fungi. So what we try to understand in my group in how the fungi are, what, what kind of role the fungi are playing in the functioning of the forest ecosystems. We try to harness genomics for understanding the tree microbe interactions in this forest ecosystem. Of course, my view is really mycocentric. You see there, the mushrooms are much bigger than the trees. <laughs> <laughs> but because we, we are convinced that uh, the different types of fungi living in forest ecosystem, they play a key role, if not the major role, in carbon cycling and carbon sequestration. And that's very important these days uh, when the forests are under threat due to the climate change. So what we try to do in my, in my group and in a much larger consortium is to define the role of these fungi in forest ecosystems. We want to characterize these fungi and the interactions between fungi and trees. Hopefully we can manipulate these systems to better understand how they, they function. And in a few years from now, we may be able to introduce these data sets in, in the current models, trying to simulate the biochemical cycles. Right now, uh, microbes are just a black box, and very often they are not even taken into account in these uh, large-scale uh, models. <coughs> so let me remind you the, the the major players, the major groups of fungi living in forest ecosystems. There are at least five major groups of fungi. The, those belonging, belonging to the decomposers, to the de able to decompose organic matter. So we have the white rotus and the brown rotus and the soil saprotrophs. The white rotus are able to decay both lignin and cellulose so they are really the wood eaters. Brown rotus evolved uh, later. They don't bother in decomposing lignin, 
they just want to target cellulose to uh, decay cellulose, hydrolyze cellulose. And the soil saprotrophs, the soil saprotrophs are not able to decompose and to decay wood like these two guys, but they use organic matter or partially decayed uh, wood. And there's a fourth group of fungi I, that I really love. Uh, they are the ectomycrosal fungi, the symbionts, so the mutualistic uh, fungi interacting with plants. And of course, in all world, there's a dark side and the, the, the pathogens, the parasites, of trees are also very important players in, in forest ecosystems. So there are five major nutritional modes in forest fungi. There are five major ways to assess acquired carbon in forest ecosystems. But we know very little about the interrelationships between these different groups. How do they evolve? Are there any evolutionary connections between these major groups of fungi? We didn't know till uh, we use genomics to harness that, to tackle these questions. So, within that group, within these groups of fungi, uh, we have been focusing on the symbionts, not only because they are good fungi, edible, like the, bla the yellow chantrels, the black truffle, the matsutake, the bolids. This one, I don't recommend it. No. But you can try. Uh, so edible fungi, so they can be very useful uh, having their genomes and, and working on that can uh, provide new information on the fruitic body development. But we are mainly focusing on the ecological role of these guys. Two thirds of the ectomacosal fungi are basidomycetes, one third ascomycetes. As I mentioned and stressed and will stress strongly, they are ecologically important edible, right? And that's one interesting feature. The, the genome size is small, between 20 and, and on the average 60 megabase. So for, for, for sequencing centers, there are really good targets. So thanks to this feature, we have been sequencing a lot of these guys. So as you know, mycorrhizae, uh, mycorrhizal symbiosis is a very important process. And if you look at this slide, you understand why. For each meter of fruit, there's one kilometer of, of fungal life. Eh? So this is a, a, a striking extension of the root ecosystems. And these fungi are playing a key role in the uptake of nutrients. But we are mostly interested in my group to understand the gene networks involved in both the development of the fungal compartments but also the interaction with, with the plant. There is a series of gene networks, signaling pathways, effectors, which are involved in the early colonization of the root system, recognition and uh, signaling between the two partners, uh, how the symbiotic structures are evolving and when this symbiosis is done, how the metabolism between the two partners is coordinated. And as of today, we know very little about the mechanisms and the signals used by these uh, fungal compartments to coordinate their activity. So we expect that there are molecules, uh, diffusible molecules or proteins, peptides, which are called effectors, which may play a role in the uh, coordination of the activities between the fungal compartment there and the plant, but also between the different compartments of this fungal web. So that's what we call the, the, the symbiosis toolkit, uh, the, the set of genes needed for developing the interaction with the plant. So what do we know now uh, on the evolution of these fungi and on that the content of this symbiosis molecular toolkits? So we have been using paleogenomics to reconstruct the past and reconstruct the evolution of these fungi. And We've tried to tackle two main questions. Do all ectomaxal lineages, uh, clades, arise from similar ancestors and, and, and followed similar evolutionary trajectories? And the second question, uh, main one, are there common sets of genes to interact with host plant, what we can call the ancestral symbiosis toolkit? So, to 
answer these questions, we have been sequencing massively a large number of uh, fungal genomes, both from symbionts, but also from support crops. And then we compared the gene repertoires of these uh, fungal genomes. And this has been done in two major uh, consortia uh, projects with the Joint Genome Institute in California, the Microsoft Genomics Initiative, where we have sequenced uh, genomes from uh, abuscular mycorrhizal fungi, uh, ectomycorrhizae, orchid mycorrhizae, ericoid mycorrhizae, a large set of fungi forming different type of mycorrhizae. And uh, the 1,000 fungal genome uh, coordinated by Joy and, and, and Jason, where we are trying to sequence 1,000 genomes uh, all along the tree of life of the fungi. So not only focusing on the forest ecosystem, but try to, to use genomics to understand on a larger scale how these fungi evolved. So this is uh, a, a sample of the fungi which have been sequenced. And let's, let's do a quiz. Are there any uh, good mycologists in, in, the, in the audience? Uh, anyone picking mushrooms during fall? <coughs> Cathy, I'm sure you do. So uh, do you know this one, which is really the, the model mushroom, like Aria Micro? Do you know that one? Anyone is able to identify this good edible fungus? <laughs> the black truffle of Perigord. So you see, we have a large set of genomes covering uh, the, uh, both taxonomically uh, relevant, but also uh, ecologically relevant. So we, we, we compare the genomes of these uh, fungi First, uh, we, we, we sequence this uh, symbiotic and saprotrophic genome. So there we have a, 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 a tree which has been uh, done by using 49 fungal genomes. We identified a core gene of a core of uh, about 500 genes uh, conserved among these genomes, and we have been using these genes to work construct the history of these fungi. And so we are covering about uh, 400 million years. And you have there the evolution of the major types of uh, uh, Agaromycotina. In green, the ectomycosal fungi. In uh, yellow, the white rotus. In brown, the brown rotus. And in, uh, you know, in yellow, the saprotroph. And in white, the right rotus. And these red triangles are emphasizing the clades where the macrosal symbiosis, the ectomacrosal symbiosis evolved. And so that's the, one of the main and, and first conclusion of this work. The ectomacrosal symbiosis evolved uh, several times during the evolution of fungi, at least 10 times based on that uh, analysis, but probably more. And uh, the other conclusion, major conclusion, is the fact that ectomycorrhizal symbiosis evolved from different groups of saprotrophs. We found at least three main ways leading to the microsal fungi. Everything started about uh, 300 million years ago uh, within the auricularialis. This guy invented the white rot, so these fungi are really powerful wood decayers that are able to decay very efficiently lignin and cellulose thanks to a very wide repertoire of enzymes. And from this guy, uh, the wild protos continue to evolve and, uh, till now. And from this wild protos, we've been able to identify ectomaxal fungi like Ebola living on the dune forest, which are uh, directly uh, emerging from the wild protos. But uh, we also demonstrated that uh, a large part of the brown rotus are deriving from the white rotus. And these brown rotus gave rise to uh, many ectomaxal fungi, including the bolids. Finally, another group of ectomaxal fungi, like Lacaria bicolor, like the fly agarix, are deriving from soil saprotrophs. So over 200 million years, uh, this different group of mycorrhizae, uh, symbiotic fungi, have been evolved uh, from wild rotus, brown rotus, or soil saprotrophs. Sapro 
So now that we have the, the background, we know that the microarsal symbiosis evolved many times, evolved from white rotors, brown rotors, soil saprotroph. Can we correlate the gene repertoires with the ecological traits? Can we, uh, by comparing the gene repertoires, the gene content, uh, gene acquisition, gene decay, gene duplication, expansion or contraction of family, can we correlate the gene repertoire with ecological traits and understand why a fungus is a nandophyte or a pathogens or, or a symbiont or a leaf decay or, or, or a wood rotors. So we focused on one group of enzymes, which are those involved in the decay hydrolysis of cellulose and lignin. So we call these enzymes able to decay plant cell wall polysaccharides. We call them k enzymes, carbohydrate active enzymes. There are more, more than 500 uh, enzymes involved in lignocellulose degradation. You know many of them, like uh, uh, cellu cellulase, uh, endoglucanase, uh, uh, lytic polysaccharide monooxygenases. There is a wide range. And there's one expert in the world, Bernard Henrissa, who set up the da casein database and who helped us to make sense of this uh, casein found in the, in the different species of fungi. So we, we compare the catalog of uh, casein, about 28 gene families and subfamilies of uh, uh, carbohydrate active enzymes, oxidoreductase, uh, so about 50 to 500 genes uh, in these different species. And one of the striking results was, was the, the, the low content, so this is the number of plant cell wall degrading enzymes found in the gene repertoires of ectomaxal fungi, saprotrophs, or pathogens. And you see clearly that the ectomagosal fungi are lacking a lot of a very low number of these casemes acting on plant cell wall and able to degrade them compared to saprotroph or uh, pathogens. Let me focus on five of these key enzymes. They are really the, the major players. Two enzymes decaying lignin, the class two peroxidase, and the gluco glucose oxidase that are really uh, needed for lignin uh, hydrolysis and oxidation, and three enzymes uh, decaying crystalline cellulose, this cellulase, GH6, GH7, and GH61, which is a new family of lytic polysaccharide monooxygenase. So this is a number of genes calling for these enzymes in the white rotus, like the polypores, the brown rotus, the soil saprotroph, and in green, the ectomycorrhizae. And you see, uh, uh, and, and of course, red means many, and, and blue, low. And there's a striking difference in the gene repertoires if you compare these uh, four groups of fungi. The white rotus have a very large repertoires a repertoire of this enzyme, as expected. They are very efficient in decaying lignocellulose. The soil saprotroph, poorly able to decay uh, lignin. They have almost no or very low content in, pod, in, in uh, peroxidase or glucose oxidase. They still have a significant number of uh, enzymes acting on crystalline cellulose. And if you look at the brown rotus, they have almost no enzymes to decay uh, lignin. And, and very few enzymes, just enough to decay cellulose. These guys are relying on a different system to decay uh, lignocellulose, which is called the Fenton reaction. But look at the ectomycorrhizae there. Uh, there is almost, for, for many of them, there is no genes calling for these enzymes. They have lost the ability to decay lignin and cellulose. And that's really a striking uh, uh, result. There, this is, uh, I'm going fast on that, this is uh, the, the, the enzymes coding, the genes coding for the Fenton reaction. The Fenton reaction is a system which is used based on the release of, of uh, 
uh, hydroxyl radicals to uh, depolymerize lignin and cellulose, but mainly lignin. So the brown rotus, like the ectomycosal fungi here, are able to depolymerize without hydrolyzing the lignin to get access to the cellulose which is trapped by lignin. So it's a different way to, to decay lignocellulose. So if I summarize this part of the, the work, trying to understand uh, the ecology of these fungi, but what we can say now based on the, on the on comparative genomics that uh, there is a large group of saprotrophs like the wild rotus and the brown rotus able to decay organic matter in forest ecosystems. Microsal fungi has, have lost this ability to decay cellulose, but they still keep the possibility to depolymerize uh, lignin and probably to access nitrogen and to scavenge nitrogen. So this, this group of fungi have really a complementary role in the forest ecosystem. So the two main conclusions based on this uh, large scale genomics, on the average, uh, symbionts have reduced, have a reduced complement of genes encoding plant cell wall degrading enzymes at least compared to their ancestors, the wild rotus. This means that they are fully relying on the plant for feeding them in carbon. They really rely on the carbohydrate released by the plant to survive. But still, we've shown that some of these fungi are, some biota are still able to uh, depolymerize without using lignocellulose, probably to scavenge uh, nitrogen. So one of the, the main conclusion is there. Uh, evolution of these fungi uh, took place by genome erosion and gene loss. They evolved, adapted to the interaction with the plant by losing genes. Okay, so this is one thing. The, 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 the microsoft fungus is living within the roots feeding on tapping directly the carbon from the plant. But how the plant is able to support such a huge amount of mycelium in, in between the root cells? So we have tried to understand that by using this in vitro system, this in vitro forest. It's a poplar forest with uh, poplar seedlings interacting with lacaria bicolor, forming ectomycorrhizae with typical mycorrhizae with the mantle, the artignet. And you see that this is a 3D reconstruction of the, this part of the system, the artignet, which is the intra-radicular web. This is a massive amount of fungus uh, with a maze-like system. And, and we, we try to understand how the plant is able to, to control the proliferation of this mycelium within the roots. And we have focused on a one group of genes, those calling for small secreted proteins. There are more than 300 small secreted proteins in, in Lacaria, and more than 50 of them, the small red beads released by the VIFA landing on the root surface, 50 of them are mycorrhizae induced. They are only produced massively during the interaction with the plant. They are upregulated by 10,000 times for some of them. So we have been focusing on one of these MISP mycorrhizae induced SSP, which is uptaken, uh, probably released into the plant cells. So MISP7 is a short protein, only 5 kilodalton, accumulating within, in green there, within the IFA colonizing the roots. And this small protein is released by Lacaria in interaction with the plants. And in less than 10 minutes, MISP7 is moving toward the nucleus of the host cells. In 10 minutes, 90% of the nuclei of poplar roots are uh, containing this MISP7 uh, protein. So we've been able, um, it's really a long story short, uh, it took uh, three years to uh, three postdocs to get there, 
we, they have shown that MISP7 is able to interact with the jazz receptor. And jazz receptor is a jasmonate uh, receptor in higher plants. And jasmonate is a defense hormone. As soon as an organism is penetrating in the plant tissue, jasmonate is released and it's an alert system and then it's eliciting the defense reactions. Instead in mycorrhizae, uh, MISP7 is interacting with the JAS protein, the JAS receptor, stabilizing this JAS receptor and preventing the elicitation of the fungal defense reaction. So in fact, uh, Lacaria have uh, the ability to control the plant immunity and to control the defense reactions. So if I try to summarize what I said uh, there, we have a very interesting evolutionary, evolutionary pattern. Ectomax fungi uh, evolved by using two different contrasting patterns. They have lost their ability to decay lignin, lignocellulose, and they have to uh, lose this uh, ability if they don't want to eat the roots hosting them and eliciting plant defense reactions. And at the same time, so they are evolving by gene loss, at the same time, they are also able to create, innovate, and produce uh, new genes. New genes which are used to control the plant immunity. One slide or on, on the over large group of symbiotic fungi, the arbuscular mycorrhizae, they belong to a different phylum, the glomerulomycota. Till now we have been talking about dicaria, ascomycota or basidiomycota. These guys are, are, are the ones which help the plant to land 450 million years ago. But it took us more than 10 years to sequence the genome of one of the model systems in this group of fungi called uh, rhizophagus, formerly called glomus intraradicus. It's a very complex genome, but now we have, uh, we have sequenced this model system, but we have also sequenced additional ones. And what we've showed, there are very large genomes between 100 and 500 megabase. Uh, they are overloaded by transposable elements, which may play a role in, in the genome plasticity. These guys are able to interact with all plants on the planet. They lack, they are also missing the plant cell wall degrading enzymes. They have l the lowest gene repertoire in plant cell wall degrading enzymes. They are obligate biotroph. They, have also, they are also using effector-like small molecules to interact with the plant and control the plant immunity. And we observed a massive expansion of communication genes uh, in these fungi. Glomerular mycota, arbuscular mycorrhizae, basidiomycota, ectomycorrhizal, ascomycota, ectomycorrhizal, evolved similar genomic features to learn how to interact with the plants. So there we have a, a very a nice uh, convergent evolution, which is covering about 400 million years in very different uh, clades of fungi. So with that, I would like to thank many people. All this work is done within the Microsoft Genomics Initiative Consortium and the 1KFG. Uh, three main uh, collaborators, Igor Grigoriev, who is uh, the leader of the Fungal Genome Program at the JGI, Bernie and Risa, uh, uh, expert in Kzymes, uh, David Ibet, uh, working on the evolution of fungi, and in my group, people working on the uh, control by ectomycosal fungi of the plant immunity. And I, I can take probably one or two questions if you have time. Thank you very much. Thank you.